Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Movies. They're pretty good. I'm your host, Travis Dudding, and a little bit about me. This is my first podcast, so bear with me as I get comfortable with doing this and with all the audio issues, which I'm sure there are going to be plenty. Uh, it, but don't worry, I assume it's going to get better over time, and I hope everyone sticks with me throughout that. I am currently studying film. I'm hoping to get a degree in film history. I was in the Air Force for eight years, so thank me for my service. And I am a father of two kids and four cats. I hope you enjoy this show. I hope you continue to listen. listen. I hope I learn how to speak properly and... I hope you have fun. Thank you. The first film I wanted to cover on this podcast is just so happens to be my favorite film, 1964's Mary Poppins. Directed by Robert Stevenson, it's not only my favorite Disney movie, but my favorite movie in general. And I thought a lot about this over the years. It's very hard to pick a favorite movie, but just that's the one I always came back to. Just growing up with it. It's just not only just a comfort, but now, after seeing as many films as I have, I can see it as a technical achievement and an actual, like, just a good movie. Not just a good Disney movie, a good kids movie. It is just a good movie. Uh, so, what I want to do is just, like, kind of just go through the different plot points of the film and just different things that stick out to me and things like that. So start off with of course like most movies at the time you just get a medley of the score and all the key points different songs and things like that uh then so you get a little bit of that kind of a taste of what's to come in the soundtrack and open with uh mary poppins just hanging out on a cloud you know like people do 1900s great britain you get a little bit of her and then you zoom down and in the streets and you got Bert with his one man band set up is performing for money and being funny and you get him interacting with people you get a little bit of his personality which I like I really like Dick Van Dyke I think he's really really good in this I know I've heard a lot of stuff about like that he did not know how to do a British accent and it kind of shows but it's also like, I feel like I'm a little biased because that was probably my first introduction of a British accent. So I hear it and I'm like, oh, I don't think it's that bad. But I'm sure, like, it's nails on a chalkboard to people that are actually from the UK. But I really like his character. I really like him as an actor, as a comedian. He's very funny. One thing that's interesting about his character is he's the only one that seems to be he's doing fourth wall breaks and it's kind of interesting because no one else does any does this in the movie so he's kind of like our the audience guide which i like um and he's kind of like keeping the story log a couple different times so he talks to the audience he's telling us like hey what are you doing here oh you're looking for this house it's down the street I don't really know what we, as the audience, like why we're looking for this family. That's never really established. I'm just kind of curious to know what the writer's reasoning for that is, but whatever. Uh, moving along, he, then he, get, he shows off uh, the neighbor's house, which is Admiral Boom, uh, former British Navy Admiral that turned the top of his house into a ship like most retirees do you know you go down to florida he gets just a bunch of navy ships on the roof and he also has like a first mate with him which is kind of weird like i wonder what their like relationship when they're not doing like navy related things like firing off the cannon that's his whole like personality that's his whole character arc is just being a guy that shoots a cannon right on time and he keeps time 
And so that comes out throughout the movie. That's a important plot point, I guess. Not like a plot point, but a, a plot device. Kind of moves the movie, movie along. Anytime you need to know what time it is, then there's probably some scene about Admiral Boom. But yeah, I just found it interesting. Like, I wonder, it just keeps me wondering, like, what their relationship is like. Like, what their day to day stuff when they're not doing firing the cannon from the roof. So then, after that whole thing is set up, then we get to go to the Banks' house. That's the main family of the whole movie. And as we're showing up to the house, Bert's walking by, he introduces us to Admiral Boom, and then he starts this conversation with them, and uh, Admiral Boom's asking him where he's going, he says he's going to the Banks' house, and... Admiral Bloom says there's a nasty bit of weather there. So, because as you, you're walking up to the house, you can hear the cook and the maid fighting with the children's nanny at the time, which is Katie Nana. And she's quitting as we're getting there. And she's lost the kids at the zoo. They ran off. She Apparently the kids are being terrible all the time. And she's had enough, so she's quitting. She's like, oh, these kids ran off. Uh, not my problem anymore. And just decides to quit without like making sure that they're safe or anything like that. You know, stuff that you do back in the 1900s, Great Britain. So yeah, she's, she's there. She's quitting. She's about to leave. Then the mom comes. And she's like, oh, you're quitting? Don't care. Women need to the right to vote. And I'm going to sing a song about it. So she starts singing the Sister Suffragette song, and all the while, the Katie Nana is trying to say, like, hey, like, I'm out of here. And she's like, doesn't matter. Women's rights. And so that keeps going, and then finally she's like, oh, wait, where are the kids? Like, yeah, I've been trying to tell you this whole time, but you're singing about voting rights. But so, and she's like, oh, where are the kids? So then, like, that she's all, like, worried, like, oh, and then here comes Mr. Banks, like, oh no, what's he going to do? Uh, what he's going to do is sing his boring song about being uh, how great it is to be a man in Great Britain in the early 1900s. And it's all about, like, order and, I guess, power, but it's not really emphasizing that too much. It's just all about, like, everything is on schedule. I like it like this. I like everything to be normal. And that's it. Everything's great as long as nothing's different. So that's like, I guess it's a fun way to be like, hey, this is the, this is the bad guy of the film. Like kind of like, oh, like he's all boring and kids don't want boring. Like we want fun and we're going to turn this boring guy into a fun guy. But like, you see it done a lot now. Uh, not good like this like i'm not saying this is like the best way to do it but i think it's preferable to the way it is now but so yeah anyways he gets home he's singing a song and then also gets to a point where he's like oh where are the kids and they're like oh like they're gone it's like oh well i'm gonna fire katie nana where is she like oh she just quit oh okay well i'm gonna call the police and as he's calling the police on his little, like, crank phone that they had on the wall, like, as soon as he dials them and gets an answer, then Constable Responsible shows up with the kids, and he's like, oh, what great service. I thought that was a good joke. I think that was a good one. Um, of course, I'm not going to give the good delivery on it. You know, just watch the movie. I'm sure you guys have seen it. Uh yeah, he shows up with the kids, and they're like, oh, we, like, our kite flew away, so we were chasing it. And which like that's understandable and like and it's funny that like that was the last straw for Katie Nana to be like, I'm gonna quit. Like these kids wanted to keep their kite, like how dare them? Like just like wait for them to go get it. Like, I don't know. Whatever. That's like of all like is that like how strict things were in Britain back then that like you couldn't like like no i don't know it just seems like there's like worse things that they could have been doing anyways 
so yeah like he's like and right here you also get the first instance of seeing just how strict their dad is and how like the the constables like saying all these nice things like oh like it's understandable like i get it like i love the kites and i love like you know and it's hard to keep them away so i get them right or running after it and then like mr banks is just saying like no nope, don't care like rules are rules everything's just supposed to be perfect and this isn't perfect so they're gonna be punished and like i like the the look that the constable gives the dad like it's like oh really like this guy's too much of a hard ass but i i noticed that that look uh, I don't think I had really noticed it before, but, you know, I'm not really looking for that stuff, like, in the past. So, yeah, he sends the kids off to bed, and he puts on his, like, awesome maroon smoking jacket that looks like it's made out of moving blankets from the U-Haul. Uh, and then, you know, he's adding to his song about, like, oh, how great a boring life is. And, like, talking about, like, oh, like need to get a new nanny now like what am i gonna do like which i'm also like not because sh- it's not like the mom works and she also seems to be hiding the fact that she's doing like these women's rights rallies and stuff like that from her husband so i'm not like like what's she supposed to be doing all day you know if she's not if she's not working like, what does Mr. Banks think? Like, obviously, like, it's a good cause for her to be out there, like, getting, like, women's rights and everything. Like, like I'm, I'm not saying, like, she shouldn't be doing that. Like, she should be home with the kids. Like, that's, like, besides the point. I'm just saying, what in his mind is she doing? That's just a good question. Like, I'd like to know, like, what, what he thinks. It's like, oh, well, she's too rich to take care of the kids. So she just sits around and stares at the wall while the nanny takes care of the kids i don't know i i'm just asking questions here guys so yeah he's uh talking about like oh we need a new nanny and then here come the kids with their pajamas on and a piece of paper like oh like we heard you know we're gonna need a new nanny and they come to apologize and also be like oh we wrote an ad or as they say advertisement with their cute little british accents and then they read off their like ideal candidate for a nanny which is of course is like give us candy let us do whatever we want but in a cute song also michael has like not contributed to this at all he's like put like three lines in and he's not singing either he just like he harmonizes the end part but he's just like oh i put that part oh i put that part so jane's really pulling all the heavy duty work here and you know he does like what any good dad would do when their kids do something like that and rips up the ad and throws it in the fireplace you know the normal thing but wait guess what happens the note floats up the chimney and flies right to mary poppins little cloud and it puts itself together and she reads it and she's like now's my chance so yep that then cuts to the next scene it's the next morning you get a nice scene at breakfast and they look out the window all these nannies are waiting and they're like this huge line all all the new candidates for the job and then then you get a nice scene of like what like the effect of admiral boom is so he fires his cannon right on the dot right on the hour and then you get some pretty good practical effects of all the pictures swinging on the walls and the piano sliding around and they got to catch the vase before it falls and they just have it down like perfectly it's like all routine to them like this this vase is gonna fall this piano is gonna slide this picture is gonna fall like and then they just know where to be every hour of the hour or every hour on the hour so but i i I think it's a good display of the practical effects and i really like the way that that, those scenes play out i think it's good nice good physical comedy good practical effects they probably do some like cgi bs today that wouldn't look that good 
practical effects pretty much always look better. So, kids are looking out the window. Of course, none of these nannies look like what their ad said. And so they're like, oh, like, so I don't know why they guys, these people showed up. But the wind starts blowing and all the nannies start flying away. So it gets a little more magic and the kids are all like, whoa, I can't believe this is happening. And then, oh, who is it? Mary Poppins floating down. And they're like, oh, is she a witch? No, witches have brooms. Duh, you idiot. So she's floating down. Then she is right at the door. And as soon as the door opens, then she walks right in and just starts saying, like, hey, I'm here for the job. I'm the perfect person. You're you're going to hire me. And the dad's just like, so like dumbstruck like that like oh like she's assertive and like kind of impressed by it like but also a little bit like hesitant like oh we'll see like yeah but then he's distracted because he sees that she's holding the note that he ripped up and threw in the fireplace and that it's all like put together and he's like what like how did this happen and he's all confused and basically not listening to anything she says at the after that point and he's just like looking around the fireplace and he's like miming tearing it and throwing it in and it's just like basically a complete mental breakdown over this seeing this note that he thought he tore up and threw away but she gets the job because he wasn't listening to anything that she said and she just gets right to work immediately and first things first uh sit on the rail and slide up the rail that's impressive and kids are all like stunned like oh she gets in there she's got her magic carpet bag she's pulling out like a whole ass lamp out of the bag and like big picture frame and it's just like a regular like like I don't know, briefcase dimensions bag and she's pulling all these like large objects out of there so that and those are pretty cool effects that's probably like pretty simply done but it looks great, especially for 1964. Kids are impressed. They're like, whoa, this is awesome. And she's like, all right, like, if I'm going to work with you, I got to know what you're all about. So she gets out her magic tape measure. And they think they're like, oh, we're just going to see how tall we are. And then it's like some starky comment about their personality instead of, like, height. And then, you know, she does the tape measure on herself and says, practically perfect in every way because she's a narcissist just kidding so then first things first they she's like oh let's play a game and then she just tricks them into cleaning their room basically uh then so she's singing the song spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down so it's like yeah like let's make this fun like yeah you gotta clean your room that sucks but we're gonna make it fun by singing and doing magic so she like gives them the ability to like snap and then the chore is done i guess uh but michael spends the whole time trying to figure out how to snap so he doesn't really pull his weight for this whole time because he's just standing there trying to snap the whole time also i like i don't know who did the foley on this but the snap sound effect sounds like you clap two pieces of wood together in, in an abandoned Walmart or some shit. Like, it's just way... I don't know. It's, like, super echoey. And it's the same sound effect for, like, all three of them. And like, any anyone that snaps is just the same, like, two pieces of wood and a damp cave echo. Also, like, I, I like the scene where... So, there's a part where she's... During the song, where she does, like, a little, like, vocal solo... And it's her reflection in the mirror, but the reflection is moving differently than her, which like is always like a good effect in like a horror movie, but like they use it here for comedy and it looks cool. It always looks good. So now their room's clean. So let's go for a walk. And there we see Bert like right across the street at the park and he's doing all these chalk drawings and he's like, a really good artist, which I guess isn't that, like, you hear about it all the time. Like, oh, this person was just a 
janitor and then they're like an amazing artist or like you know everyone starts out somewhere but it's like he's got some like really good chalk drawings and it's like also how is he not making more change off people but also there maybe there's just less of an appreciation for the work of like street artists and street performers and stuff like that back then i don't know i wasn't there guys yeah so they walk up to him they're talking to him and it's like, oh, like, look at this one. Look at this one. And it's like, oh, like, what are you guys doing with Mary Poppins? And like, oh, we're just going for a walk. And he's like, ah, fam, if you're with Mary Poppins, this ain't no normal walk. Yeah, he's like, then he's like, purposefully says like, oh, like, like, I bet like she's going to make us go on these chalk drawings. And he like makes up something like he basically like does like makes up some like random set of steps like oh you gotta do this you gotta do this you gotta do this and she's like getting all mad like nah like not even close like you idiot let, let me do it and then immediately like just sends them all into the chalk drawing and i think this this sequence is really good like i like i think they pulled off very well at a very early time the use of both animation and live action because not only is it just an, is, is the background animated and then the characters they're interacting with are animated, but they also made it look like a chalk drawing. Just the way that they painted it, I don't know what method they used, but it, it looks like they're in a chalk drawing and it just looks beautiful. The whole thing's so colorful. I like their outfits, the like little candy stripe suit and everything like that. Looks amazing. And we, this is where we get the song Jolly Holiday. And they're singing that together. Then it's just like, oh, just song back and forth about like, like, oh, it's so great to be with you. No, it's so great to be with you. And then eventually they get to a little cafe, outdoor seating area. You get the penguin waiters. That's a good scene. And you got Bert dancing with his like super low crotch pants that like, goes down to his knees which i'm not sure like what the you gotta have like a 10 inch inseam at that point like how low it is but like i don't know i would have loved to know the dimensions of those pants and they find a carousel they get on it uh you know since it they're being with the uh, mary poppins then they're like oh like carousel's fun but too bad we can't ride these horses and she's like oh bet and so the horses come off the carousel and then they can just ride them regularly but they're still carousel horses so you can see like the i like the little detail of you can see the pole going down the center of the carousel horse that you hold on to you can see it like dragging through the dirt as they're like going down the path so i thought that was a good detail of like making it seem more realistic or i guess plausible like you know there's nothing realistic about being in an animated world with a carousel horse down the path but it it felt more real if that makes sense so then we're getting a little glimpse at a hunt that is going on in this animated world and then you get a uh seemingly irish catholic fox that is trying not to be hunted because he's like saying all this stuff like oh faith of Bagora it's like all these like different phrases and stuff he's got the thick accent and you know oh it's them red coats again so they see that that this fox is being hunted and they're like oh yeah we're gonna help him and so they help him out uh that works out then they crash through a gate and end up in a horse race and so they're using their carousel horses for the horse race and of course uh, Mary Poppins wins because you know why wouldn't she and that's when you get the supercalifragilisticexpialidocious song so and then you know ever, most people know that one I'm not going to talk too much about that like there's really nothing to add on that. So they're there. They're singing the song. They're having fun. Like, oh, yeah, she won. Cool. And then it starts raining, which makes all the backgrounds and everything start to blur. 
because they're in a chalk painting. So if it's raining in the real life, then the everything's melting away. So that's kind of a cool effect that they have. And then they're like, oh, no. And then they're just, like, back out in the real world again. And so they go back to the house. And they're like, okay, like, you've been in the rain. Wet clothes. Like, let's take some cold medicine, like, just in case. Like, you've been out there. And the kids are fighting. Like, no, I'm not going to take the medicine. Like, you can't make me. And so she finally, like, gets them to take it. And it tastes different for everybody. Like, it's whatever they, like, want it to taste like. It's like, I think, Michael, it's chicken soup. I didn't write it down. Uh, but I do know that Mary Poppins, for her, it tastes like rum punch. It just, like, rolls her R's on the rum punch. Then, so they're like, oh, like, she says, oh, it's not, like, time to go to sleep. And they're like, oh, we can't go to sleep. We're too excited. Like, we did this. Like, we went for a ride to the countryside. We went on a carousel. We were in a horse race. And Mary Poppins gaslights them into thinking that none of that actually happened and because she just wants them to go to sleep and so she starts singing the song stay awake which that is like as a parent that is a good song to get your kids to go to sleep just would put that one on repeat a bunch until they fell asleep so the next day they're out for another walk or walking down some alleyway and then a dog starts barking at them this cute little dog wearing a sweater and everything. You see it earlier in the song where, or in the scene where Bert's doing his one man band thing, and the dog's name is Andrew. Guess not an important detail, but just so you know, guys, I know the name of the dog in Mary Poppins, so be impressed. Uh, but anyways, so dogs barking at them. Mary Poppins understands it because she's magic, and. They're like, okay, like, it's an emergency. We gotta go. And they get to this house, and Bert answers the door. And he's like, oh, it's my Uncle Albert. Like, he's, like, stuck again. And you find out that whenever Uncle Albert starts laughing, he floats up to the ceiling, and he can't come down until he stops laughing. But he just keeps thinking, you know, like... I mean, we've all been there where we're trying not to laugh and then it just makes everything funnier and then you just keep laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing. And so then we get the song, I Love to Laugh. Everyone, of course, by the end of the scene, everyone's floating around the ceiling and having a little tea party and everything. So out of this, we get a joke that comes back later in the film. And the joke is, no, it's two people talking. One of them says, I know a man with a wooden leg named Smith. And the other person goes, what's the name of his other leg? You know, big reaction, of course. Like, it's the funniest joke that's ever been written. And then they keep laughing and laughing and laughing until eventually, like, oh, like, how do we get down? And then it's like, oh, you have to think of something sad. And then, so, Mary Poppins being the eternal buzzkill was like, oh, like, well we better do that so then they all start thinking of sad things like oh like we have to go home that's like the big thing it's like oh like the you know oh no day's over we gotta go home and then they all float down and then they get back to the house and mr banks is like hey the kids are having fun that's unacceptable fun's bad i'm bad and he's like about to fire mary poppins and she's like, yeah, you're right. Like, they should be doing, like, important things. Like, so how about for my day off, you take your kids to work. And I don't have to hear you talk anymore. So he's like, oh, yeah. Like, that's a good idea. So another, like, basically, like, she uses Inception to be, like, make it seem like it's his idea. And he's like, yeah, I'm so smart. Like, I'm going to take my kids to work. So that's the plan. Her job is safe for the time being. I'm going to go, like, I'm going to take the kids to work. So, she's back upstairs, doing her nanny stuff. Time for bed again. And here we get the song, Feed the Birds. Which might be my favorite one. But, and I'll talk about it more when I get to the next song that is in contention for being my favorite. But this is another one. Really good. Putting the kids to sleep. Really good at putting me to sleep. Just beautiful song. Feed the birds. 
just so happened to be Walt Disney's favorite song from the movie. I don't know, maybe of all time. Like, there's stories about him uh, coming into the office of the Sherman Brothers. The Sherman Brothers, the ones that wrote the music for the whole movie, uh, great songwriters, a uh, bunch of different Disney movies and some other non-Disney stuff. Really, really great. Really great musicians, really catchy stuff, like, just great at what they did. Uh, but there's stories about him, uh, Disney, coming into their office, like, oh, just, uh, you just say, like, play the song. Like, not, like, in a mean way, but, like, that's all he'd have to say is, like, play the song, and then they knew what song he was talking about. And, like, I think it happened a lot, like, he found it very contemplative, so, because you hear, you hear that it happened a lot, like, right when he was, like, close to dying, so... I think it was just like his like reflecting song and probably put him at ease a little bit when he already knew he was sick. Anyways, moving on from that. We play that song. The whole point of the song is like that it's about this lady that is sitting out on the steps of the church near the like in the center of the city and she's just asking for money to so she could buy bird food for the birds and like keep the birds like happy and everything and it just goes into like how she gets ignored by people all the time just like oh this poor poor person this homeless lady like cast her aside it's about just how like she doesn't let that get her down because all she cares about is keeping these birds alive like this is what she loves and that's what matters to her not like getting a job or you know anything like that it's just like nope I gotta keep the birds fed um so that comes into play the next day because they're on their little field trip with dad going to the bank he's a banker I don't think I mentioned that before but so yeah he's a banker they're going to the bank and they each got their little money that they've been saving which is like two coins and Michael's like, oh, that's the bird lady from the song. Like, I'm going to go give her the money. And Mr. Banks like, what? No, come on. Like, you got to invest. You got to invest, bro. Mr. Banks is like a crypto bro today. It's all about, like, getting that Bitcoin. And he'd probably be like an NFT guy. He's going to corner you at a party and tell you about NFTs. Anyways, so he's like, no, nope, you're not doing that. Don't throw your money away. Come on, let's keep going. We're going almost to the bank. They get there. And so they're in there. Then they meet the they meet the boss. They meet, it's like, oh, like, Michael's brought his money. Like, he's going to invest. And he's like, I don't want to do that. I want to give it to the bird lady. And then they're like, oh, what? We can't have that. Let's sing a song to get you excited about investments. That's just exactly what a little kid wants to hear is like the song about investments. What saves this scene from being like the most boring song of the whole movie is Dick Van Dyke is there as, so he's playing two roles. Obviously he's Bert, but he's also there as the old man who's the owner of the bank, like the main banker, Mr. Dawes. And he's there, he's doing some great physical comedies, like, because he's in, like, old age makeup and everything. He's got the cane, he's, like, almost falling down, like, half the time and everything. And a lot of, like, whoa, that, that type of stuff. Great stuff. Really, like, the saving grace of the scene. And so they sing this whole song, like, oh, like, you gotta, you gotta invest. You put that money in, it grows and grows and grows and grows. And Jane and Michael sit, they listen to the whole thing, and then the song's over, and he's like, so what are you going to do? And he decides that he's going to be a dirty communist and throw his money away and feed the poor. Just kidding. Uh, so yeah, he's like, nope, give me back my money. I'm out of here. And so he takes it and runs, and but the people in the lobby here like oh give me back my money and they're like what the bank's not giving someone their money and then there's a big run on the bank which like i i guess that was a thing that happened a lot like i've only like i could think of one other movie that this happens in and that's it's a wonderful life 
but I've only I like ever like seen it in movies. I assume it did happen a lot, especially back when there was like one bank for the town or something like that. But I can't imagine like hordes of people at the Chase Bank like demanding that they get their money out. Maybe it does happen. Maybe I'm ignorant of it, but it's just crazy to think. It's just crazy to think of in a modern sense. But I'm I'm not doubting that it happened. But it's just funny. Those scenes are always funny. So yeah, he causes a big panic, big run on the bank. They gotta close down. But more on that later. So yeah, the kids take off running. Uh, they get away from their dad and they're out running through the alley. Of course, there's some scary lady who's like, oh, if you lost your way? And then they're like, nope, you're too scary. Run away. And then they run into Bert. And at first they're scared because they are worried that he might get canceled for doing blackface. But then they realize that his face is just dirty from his chimney sweep job. And they're like, oh, okay, good. It's just Bert. He's just doing his job. And we don't have to cancel him. But... The other good news is, it's Bert. We're safe. We love him. And he's like, okay, I'll take you home. I know the way. And this is where we get my other contender for favorite song. Now, this was also the favorite song of the Academy Awards voters. And it was the winner of Best Original Song at the Oscars that year. And I think for good reason, because this is, I'd say, the catchiest of the songs. Uh... It's another one that I really like. And I think that what makes it interesting is that it's broken up into different pieces. So he sings like a stanza of it. Then we get a little scene. Sings another little bit. Another scene. Sings another little bit. Long scene. Sings some more. So it's not just like one long song sequence. Which is I think a little, it's a little unique. I mean sure it happens a lot. I'm not the biggest expert on musicals but in my opinion, like a lot of it brings something a little different than just a straight up song sequence. So he's like, brings the kids home and the mom's there like, oh, like you have the kids. Oh, hey, you got a broom? Like, come clean our chimney. He's like, oh, no, I got to do the governor's house. And she's like, no, don't care. Like, come do our house. Because she's not listening to that. She's like, oh, I got shit to do. So, he's like, all right, I'll come in and clean the chimney. This is where you get a little bit more of the song. And after he cleans it out, he's sitting there. Mary Poppins comes home. He's like, oh, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, just working. And the kids are looking up the... They're like got their heads in the fireplace. They're looking up the chimney that has just been clean, and then they get sucked up. Like they just like whoosh, up the chimney. And Mary Poppins is like, "Oh, can't believe this is happening!" Like she's not the one that did it. Like come on, like we can see right through you. And then they get sucked up the chimney. Then up Mary Poppins and Bert go. They're all four up there. Now this is like one of my. This might be one of my favorite sequences visually like I really like the like sunset ambiance like where it's like just getting dark so dusk uh, so it's like dusk you get the the cityscape you get like all the rooftops of the buildings and everything like that they're on the roof it's just aesthetically very pleasing because you got those sunset colors you got like a little dimly lit it's a very good ambiance and I really like that uh, you get a little more of the song and they're singing and then Mary Poppins taps her magic umbrella on the chimney and the smoke turns into stairs that also looks really cool it's like a very cool visual effect that they got to do that like I always like the look of that the smoke stairs and then they get up to they get up to like the highest rooftop that they go to and they're up there, they're singing the song, and then the whole London looks like a Thomas Kincaid painting. It just looks really pretty, like, but you got those, like, bursts of light that, you know, that that's what I think of when I think of, like, a Thomas Kincaid painting. As not that he's, like, the best artist, but that, that specific style of the, like, glowing warm light around the lights, that's what I'm thinking of. 
Um, but very pretty, very good, like, painted background that they use there. Uh, so they took the stairs up, like, the smoke stairs, but then they just, like, get on clouds, and then I guess they take the smoke escalator down because they're just, like, they're not walking. They just kind of float down. They get down to the bottom. They back to the rooftop where they came from, and then all the other chimney sweeps start popping out of holes and everything like that, and then it's time for the step-in-time sequence. Now you got, like... This is where everyone's, like, showing off their best moves. It's very stomp, that, like, Broadway show where they're just, like, banging on trash cans and doing flips and stuff. That is giving off that kind of vibe, uh, but obviously, like, way before stomp. Obviously, you can't, like, make something in 1964 that rips off stomp, where it predates it by, like, 30 years. But... Very cool scene. All kinds of good dance moves. Everyone's doing flips. That keep, just still keeping with that rooftop aesthetic. Looking beautiful. And then uh, Admiral Boom's up there with his first mate on his roof. And he's like, uh, what are all these poor people doing dancing around the roofs? Like, let's shoot them. So they load up the cannon with fireworks, which I'm not, like, I didn't know that was a thing you could do. But... It is, apparently. So they start shooting fireworks at everybody, and Mary Poppins like, nope, not safe. Let's go back downstairs. So at her and the kids and Bert and every chimney sweep in London, because they're done with their little dance break that they probably do every single night, uh, go down, and they're all dancing around. They're, like, still continuing the party. Like, you know, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Closing time vibes. Uh... So yeah, they're all dancing around the Banks' living room and like the mom's like, what's going on? Mr. Banks comes home. Like, imagine like you've had like, you take your kids to work. Uh, they're the reason that like there's a run on the bank, which is like an insane hassle for a bank. Like, and you're probably going to lose your job. And it's like, oh, at least I get to go home tonight. And then there's just a bunch of people that you don't know dancing around your living room. They're all dirty because they've all been, like, having their heads and whole bodies and chimneys all night. And, yeah, I just can't imagine a worse, a worse end to your day where you're going to get fired. And he's like, what's all this? And then they're like, oh, we're out of here. And they, everyone shakes, shakes his hand on the way out, like, thank you, governor. And they all go on their merry way. And so, somehow he's like, oh, this is Mary Poppins' fault. Like, anything that's fun, I'd hate, and it's her fault. So he's like, all right, you're fired. And she's like, all right, I'll pack my stuff, and I'll be out of here tomorrow. And then he gets a call, and now he's got to go back to the bank, and, you know, he knows he's going to get fired. And he's, like, kind of sitting there, kind of, like, sitting in his office or I don't know I don't know what kind of room it is like the room where you sit and you smoke your pipe and start the fireplace like that kind of British rich people room he's in that room and Bert's like you know he didn't finish his job apparently so he's like still doing that and he's like still doing chimney sweep stuff but then he's like kind of imparting some wisdom because Mr. Banks is like oh this is all Mary Poppins fault and Bert kind of, like, agrees with them, but also puts it in, like, a way that it's, like, oh, yeah, like, you know, like, he made your kids, like, she made your kids happy, like, how dare her, like, he's, he's not, he's not blatantly sarcastic and passive-aggressive about it, but he's, like, he's putting in those hints to, like, kind of make Mr. Banks, like, come to realize himself, like, oh, I've kind of been a bad dad, like, and these kids look up to me no matter what. Like, I treat them like crap. I treat them like shit. Like, I'm not a, I'm not the best dad, but I, but they still love me. They still look up to me, and I think I need to be more, like, worthy of them looking up to me. And so he gets that kind of wisdom imparted onto him by Bert. Then he gets the call saying, like, oh, I'm gonna get fired. And so he's like, all right, like, he heads down there, he's got his 
gets his umbrella, gets his hat, and heads down to the bank. He gets there. It's, like, super ominous. He's in this, like, big, red, dimly lit boardroom. Like, super, like, it looks really cool. Like, they did a good job with this. Um, But it's also, like, looks pretty scary, too. So he's there, big, long table, and they start off with a speech, like, uh, in... Oh, they're like way back, like in the early years of the bank, uh, we funded a shipment of tea to the American colonies, which, you know, got dumped into the harbor, Boston Tea Party, all that stuff. It's like, that's the last time there was a run on the bank, like that long ago. And like, and today is the first time since the Boston Tea Party that there's been a run on this bank. Like, so this is a big deal. It's your fault. You brought your kids. Like, so obviously you're getting fired. But they don't just fire him. Like, they're like, all right. Like, the boss, like, to one of the other guys is like, all right, do it. And so, like, goes up to Mr. Banks, uh, pulls the boutonniere off his lapel, and tears the flower in half, and then pins it back on. Then he grabs his umbrella and puts it inside out and gives it back to him and then he takes his hat off and punches a hole through it so that's like i like that like british aristocrat like i'll show you now you're less fancy like that's like that's the worst thing that can happen not the getting fired but like now you're fired and your outfit's stupid like that's like the nail in the coffin for like a rich british person apparently and Mr. Banks is like, yeah, like, this sucks. And then the Mr. Dawes is like, do you have any last things you want to say? And, like, now that he's, like, lost everything, seemingly, he's just he's seeing things through a different perspective. He's like, well, the only thing to say when there is nothing to say is supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And the Mr. Paz is like, that's, there's no such thing, you idiot. Like, what are you talking about? And then Mr. Banks is laughing. And it's like, oh, like, how about a joke? Like, uh, and then he uses the one, the man with the wooden leg named Smith joke. He's like, and, but he uses his kids as like the people in the joke. So he's like, there's two people, there's two people, Jane and Michael. Jane says to Michael, I know a man with a wooden leg named Smith. And Michael says, what's the name of his other leg? And then he's laughing. And he's like, ah, what, you know, I'm out of here. And he takes off. He's like singing Spoonful of Sugar as he's like skipping out of the boardroom. I might have had the names mixed up. Like it's, it, I know he uses Jane and Michael, but it might have been the other way around. That doesn't matter. The sentiment is still there. Uh, so yeah, he skips, he leaves. He's just, gone and then Mr. Dawes is sitting there thinking he's like man with a wooden leg named Smith and then it like finally dawns on him he finally gets the joke and like apparently he hasn't like heard a joke ever and thinks it's the funniest thing he's ever heard in his life and starts laughing he starts floating like everyone's freaking out like come back like the it's his son like Mr. Dawes Jr. he's like daddy come down you know but then he cuts away from Mr. Dawes laughing and floating in the air. Uh, then you see it's the morning and the kids are sad that Mary Poppins is leaving. She's packing her bags and they're like, where are you going to go? She's like, just on to the next family that needs me, that type of thing. Uh, then they hear the door. Oh, oh then you see... Mrs. Banks is downstairs talking to the constable. Like, they're looking for... She's on the phone. She's looking for her husband, who's been missing all night. And then he finally shows up singing. He's got his, like, hat hole flap blowing in the wind and everything. Uh, he's all jumping around and singing. So this is, like... it. Like, imagine, like, the most uptight person in the world. Is like and he's missing and then he comes home like singing and happy and has an actual personality now that's like gotta be pretty eye-opening for you 
Um, and then, like, the kids are like, oh, dad's home. Like, let's go see what's going on. And then he, like, uh, they look over the rail and he pulls up the, their broken kite from behind his back and it's fixed. And they're like, oh, like, he fixed it. He mended it. And they're all excited. They go down and then they start singing the song about flying kites and fixing them. And they go out to the park. They're flying the kite. You see Mr. Dodds Jr. And he's like, oh. And then he's like, his personality is like completely turned around. He's like, Banks, like, uh, like that, that joke was so funny. Father died laughing. And he's like, oh, no. Like, he's like, no, never. Like, like oh, I'm so sorry. Like. It's like, no, don't worry about it. It's literally, like, the happiest I've ever seen him in his entire in my entire life. Like, it's better for him to go out like that. Um, and he's like, well, and the other good news is that it left the opening. So it's like, he gets his job back and a promotion. That's awesome. And Mary Poppins is like, well, job here is done. And then her umbrella is like, uh, there's a bird uh, head on the handle of the umbrella. That's talking to her. You could see the early animatronic, audio animatronic style that they used in Disneyland. So it's very like the Tiki Room birds. It's a very, it's, you can see it's the similar mechanism. I could tell by the way the tongue like kind of wiggles after it talks. Like it's kind of very loose. Uh, so that was kind of interesting to see that they're already like uh, tweaking with that technology. Cool to see. Um, but the birds all like, oh, like, like they didn't even say goodbye to you. Like they must not like you. I don't know what his problem is. Like maybe he should have spoke up earlier. But the bird is just like, but Mary Poppins, she knows better. She's like, no, nope, like, they care about their dad. Like that's the whole reason I was here. Like, so shut up. Like, that's 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 what I wanted. That's like my whole mission is to find this broken family who where the parents are too busy for their kids or what and the kids are misbehaving like this is this is why I do it like to fix this family to make them care about each other to make them see what's really important and so that she float she you know unfolds the umbrella starts floating away she makes eye contact with Bert they exchange smiles and He's like, well, like, see you next time, you know. And, you know, a little flirty, but not, like, too flirty. So it's like, kind of, you know, you kind of wonder. Um, but, yeah, so then it, go, it goes to credits, and that's the end of the movie. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful movie. I like the message. Like, it's, I think today it would be more, like, you still, like, you still got workaholic parents today. And I don't think that'll ever go away, to be honest. But I think com coming off of... And even though it takes place at the turn of the century, 1910 is the exact year that it takes place, by the way. Um, I think back... Like, even though it takes place then, it's coming out in 1964. So... This is the, it's the, what's referred to as the greatest generation. That's who's raising kids at the time. These are people that were fighting in World War II. They came home, come home from the war, and it's right into, like, this big, like, out of how many, like, industrial booms. And you got people getting into businesses that maybe they did before the war maybe they not these if you went like if you got drafted as a teen you're going right to the war and then you come home and it's like well you know all i know is how to shoot people like what do i do and so there's this big industrial boom all these people are getting new jobs everything and they gotta like work extra hard because they are learning new skills uh, they got families to pay for because you come home, like maybe you got married and then you got shipped off. A lot of people did that. A lot of people still do that in the military. So you got this new family. You got to provide for them. You got to 
pay for your house, all this stuff. So you're working hard. You're working around the clock. And maybe these, a lot of these people needed wake up calls on like, hey, maybe you're working a little too hard. You know, maybe you got to pay attention to your kids. Because if you're working hard to provide for them, but you don't have the time for them, then what's the point? Like, then just work for yourself. Then just don't work at all. You know? Like, why have these kids if you're not going to, like, give them the time and the attention and the love that they deserve? And that's, like, the... I mean, you know, that's probably obvious to a lot of people. But now, but maybe in 1964 it wasn't. You know? And it's... It's different than a lot of Disney movies because, you know, there's that trope of, like, oh, every Disney movie. Like, it, during the time of... Oh, I mean, it, it continued throughout. But especially in the time, like, when he was alive and he was executive producer, there's a lot of, like, missing parent, dead parent, that type of trope in his movies. And they say that that stemmed from guilt that he felt over that he he felt a bit of responsibility for his mom's death because he had bought his parents a house and I believe it was a gas leak and then the from inhaling the the gas that caused some health problems that eventually led to his mother's death and he felt responsible for that because it's like, oh, I bought them this house and it was, it, it killed her, you know? So that's obvious. Like, even even if that didn't play into the, like, dead parent stuff that came out in the movies, because a lot of that stuff came from other source material, you know? He didn't invent Snow White. That was a fairy tale from Europe, you know? Like, Mary Poppins wasn't even an original idea, that was a book series by P.L. Travers, who there's an entire movie about Disney getting the rights to Mary Poppins from P.L. Travers. Walt Disney's played by Tom Hanks. This is kind of like the first of his like, like national treasure that I don't really look like, but I'm going to play them and do a good job series. So he was... Walt Disney, Mr. Rogers, you know, I'm sure there's going to be more. He'll probably play Dr. Seuss at some point. And then uh, Emma Thompson as P.L. Travers. Saving Mr. Banks, that's a good movie. It's no Mary Poppins, but it is a good movie. I highly recommend it if you haven't watched it. I'm sure it's on Disney+. Plus. I don't feel like checking right now. You could Google that yourself. But yeah, a lot of this stuff came from other source materials, and I'm not familiar enough with those to say, like, oh, the, like they all had, like, a dead mom, dead dad, like, single parent situation in every one of these stories. I'm sure some of them did. Obviously, it's a big part of Cinderella, so I, I'm sure that's the one that, like, has always had it, and maybe it was invented for some of the other ones. But also, the timeline doesn't really add up on a lot of those things because I don't think his mom died till after Snow White and those first few movies would have been out. So it doesn't really make sense. A lot of times they just like to like make up stuff to make it make sense. That doesn't matter. Back to Mary Poppins. Great film. My all-time favorite. I hope you guys like it. I hope you enjoyed this episode if you have any suggestions on other movies you'd like to hear me talk about either ones i've seen ones i haven't seen just shoot me a dm comment on the posts on instagram uh thank you for listening uh maybe in the future i'll be able to read some listener questions uh anything like that uh emails ratings anything like that 